to hearts, to the heart, the mind, and the soul of the woman, where our vision is to encourage healing, deliverance, restoration, personal and spiritual growth through biblical study. Our foundational scripture is Psalms 51 and 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. All right, so let me get here to this next um, Slide, bear with me one second here. All right, so um, the overview is the purpose of this workbook is to facilitate the healing of the soul. You will need a copy of the book and a workbook to support you in doing the work. Remember, this is not just about us teaching, but this is about us going through this journey together for to begin our healing, to continue our healing. Our objective is reading the book and working through the study guide will aid in healing, deliverance, and restoration of the soul to overcome emotional wounds by activating God's healing in your life and to explore and renew your mind to God's word. All right. And so, as I stated earlier, we are doing Healing the Soul of a Woman by Joyce Meyer. Now, before we get started, which we're going into chapter three of God Wants the Wounded, we are going to open up in prayer. So I pray you're somewhere where you're able to get situated, to get settled, um, you're in a quiet place. Maybe you want to grab a journal, grab your water, hurry up and take a little break, but this is going to be good. So I encourage you to go back and listen to the previous um, teachings if you hadn't had a chance. It will catch you up to where we're at. Definitely listen to them when you're able to sit still somewhere because there's a lot of information in there and you'll miss it. All right, so all hearts and minds clear. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. We glorify you. We give you honor. God, there is none like you. You are the great I am. And God, we just, we give it all to you, God. We give it all to you because we can't do it by ourselves, God. We put every problem, every fear, every decision at your feet, God. We come to you seeking your direction, God. Lord, we're asking that you give us your mind in the matters that concern each and every Mary, Lord. We thank you, Father, that they have the ears to hear, God. We thank you, Father, that their spiritual ears have been unplugged. We thank you that their spiritual eyes are open and keen like eagles' vision, God. We thank you, Father, that the hearts are pliable and that the seeds that are planted, God, will fall on good ground and that you will continue to take it, God, and cultivate it and grow and give the increase in the Lord. We thank you for the Marys on there tonight. We thank you for the Marys that will listen in the future. God, we thank you for doing a new thing in them. We thank you for the healing journey, God. We thank you for the transparency, God. We thank you, Father, for the spirit of truth that leads and guides us. So God, we can't do nothing without your word. We cannot do nothing without your Holy Spirit. So we surrender it all to you. Less of us and more of you. We decrease so that you may increase. And it is in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, Mary. So like I said, let's get curled up. Let's get ready to get into this because God wants the wounded. And we are going into chapter three. Evangelist. Amen. Great evening, Mary's. Hugs, 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 abundant blessings and peace. Yes, as we settle in, we have taken off the day. We exhale and we trust that you have gone back to listen to the replays that, that you've been able to listen to. On last week, we covered chapter two and that is living the best life available. And we know that the only way that we can live the best life available is through our surrender to Jesus Christ. But because we don't have the time to go back and do the recaps the way we did before, we encourage you to go back and listen to the replays because with this book, Healing the Soul of the Woman, you know we have the activities that we do in the workbook as well as the chapters, and you can't really do the uh, workbook without actually reading the chapters. So what we do, and the way we've been formatting this, is we will review the chapter, and if we have time, then we go into the activity. Because what we do is it's very interactive. What we're doing in the activities is our own work. We're doing our homework, so it's so important for you to do the work so that you can receive everything that the Father has for you. So Mary's, let's buckle in as we sit at the feet of Jesus. For those of you um, that you don't understand why we call ourselves Mary's, it's because most oftentimes we're Martha's. And you know that Martha, Mary and Martha were sisters. And they were followers. They were avid followers of Jesus Christ. They were disciples. As it were, disciples as it was. And one of them, Martha, she was the busy one. She had a lot going on. But Mary, she would sit at the feet of Jesus. And even at one point, you know, uh, Martha came to Jesus and he said, tell her, tell my sister Mary to come and help me. And Jesus said, Martha, she has chosen the good part. And that's to sit at my feet. And I won't take that away from her. And that is why we call ourselves Mary's because without sitting at the feet of Jesus, gleaning from him, hanging on his every word, we can do nothing as Martha's on our, in our daily lives. Because most of us, at some point, we're doing something either in ministry, we're doing it in home, we're doing it on our jobs, we're doing it with our spouses, those that God have aligned in our life that he has called us to when we're Martha's. And this is our opportunity to be reminded that this is about us sitting at his feet and hanging on his every word. Because without sitting at his feet and without what he pours into us, we can't receive the healing. We can't receive the deliverance. We can't receive anything that he has for us. 
So with that being said, Mary, I encourage you, please go back and listen to the replay on living the best life available. Because when you come out of that, you'll realize that the best life that's available to us is that abundant life that we can only receive in Jesus Christ and nowhere else. And that in itself means healing, it means deliverance, it means restoration, but then we have to die to ourselves. We have to give up something. We have to come to the end of ourselves. So go back and listen to that chapter two. It was amazing. Um, it actually, Minister Sarah covered the um, activities as well. So she went through everything and gave us an opportunity to walk through that. Now tonight we may not uh, be able to do that, but we'll bring it up in the rear on the next week. So right now we're going to get into the book in this chapter three. So if you have your books, Marys, turn to page 19 in your books, chapter three, and that is God wants the wounded. God wants the wounded. Okay, and if you don't track with this marriage, we know that you have your prerequisite. That would be your word because we have to have our word because everything that we need is in the word. The book is the supplemental material. Okay, so have your word, have your notepads, your pens, and your Bible, either your hard copy Bible or softback Bible or on your, your tablets. Whatever devices you have, but you're going to need your word because we can't do anything without our word. All right, so Marys, we're going to go ahead and dig in. And what we're going to do tonight, we'll try to get to um, the workbook, but let's just process what this chapter three was saying to us. And for those of you that don't have your book, you know we say it's okay. You track with us. You take your notes because on next week, if we don't get to the activity uh, workbook tonight, we're going to do it next week because there are some things we want to show you and go through with you. So let's get to the summary. God wants the wounded. And when you stop and think about that, Marys, I say as we move into the summary, and even as you spent your time as a Mary with the Lord this past week, reading the book and doing your activity, in the book, the activities in the, in the workbook, our prayer is that you, you stop to define what it looks like for God to want the wounded. And why would he want a broken, fragmented vessel? So let's get into this, this uh, summary of the chapter so that we can see exactly why God wants the wounded. Because indeed, what is this? healing the soul of a woman, okay? So it says, and this, if we start from the beginning, because I really would like to read the quote so that you can kind of process that as well, especially for those that don't have the book. The unwounded life bears no resemblance to the rabbi, Brianna Manning. So when you think about that, because as I'm going through this book, I'm really taking time to process what that looks like and how that correlates to my life. And then as Holy Spirit allows the transparency and allows us to pour out, because as the facilitators, we're, again, we're as well sitting at his feet, receiving. So we're working through these activities as well. So you'll hear us and you'll hear us stop at certain points so that you can highlight it or italicize it, or process it, because sometimes we'll skirt through things and we haven't really just thought about it. The unwounded life bears no resemblance to the rabbi. And when we think of a rabbi, because this was a quote by Brianna Manning. When you think of a, a rabbi, you think of someone that have gone through a purification process. You think of someone that have gone through the fire. You think of someone that, that their life is aligned with the spirit of the Lord. It's aligned with our sovereign king. And I have something that I'm going to share with you from um, Isaiah. When Isaiah uh, encountered the Lord, 
and he saw the Lord high and lifted up and sitting on his throne. And even through that process, he then encountered one of the angels came, it was the seraphim, which in, in essence, angels came and put a hot coal to his mouth because he recognized in and of, in and of himself that there were some things that were not quite uh, what you would say pristine in him, even though he was one of the most amazing uh, sought after or the most, uh, they would say one of the most powerful prophets in the word of God. He was a mouthpiece for God. But then he recognized once King Uzziah died, which was the king of Judah at the time, and he reigned for like 57 years. And honestly, uh, according to the word, he was a really good king. But he had his things where, uh, at times where he was disobedient to God. And because of that, King Uzziah, king Uzziah he died. And I'm saying this is because anything that we do that would cause us to be disobedient to God or would cause us to act out of character and then we begin to search like we're doing now for healing, we have to then go back and see what it was that wounded our soul. Was it obedience or was it sin? Well, if we, we went back to the history and then even on the last chapter, chapter 2, it always leads us back to a life that have been broken, that have been wounded, that's oozing. And it would all be because of sin, whether it be sins of omission or commission. Things that were thrust up on us or things that we came into agreement with that would cause us to break covenant with God. And sin then wounds the soul. And Isaiah, in essence, he said that I'm a man of unclean lips. Well, you know that that had to come out of his soul. Why? Because the mind is a sum total of the mind, the, the uh, mind, the will, and the emotions. So then the manifestation that came out of an access point came out of uh, uh, his mouth that, that he spoke. It was something that he thought. And because he thought it, and then it, it, it made him stop when he, be, he beheld God high and lifted up, sitting on his throne. He recognized that he was a broken person, that he was wounded in essence, because he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. So we have to then begin to review the wounding from a different place. Let's view it from a place of maybe where we need to recognize some things in our flesh that need to be dealt with, dealt with that will ultimately produce healing in us. But then even in our brokenness, God still desires to use us. And he then brings healing with his word and his anointing and the fire of Holy Spirit that comes through that word to burn up everything that is not in us, that is in us, that is not like him, okay? So let's just move in. Wanted to just kind of set that, that background, that, that, that backdrop for you, that landscape for you, okay? So as we move into this, so that should give you kind of a, a pause or a kind of a check in your heart and your mind to kind of ponder that. God wants the wounded and that for even those that man would deem righteous and holy like the rabbi even quoted the unwounded life bears no resemblance to the rabbi. And then in the world, from the world's narrative, he would be, be, then be considered someone that is pure. But then it tells you, if he made, if this was a quote, per se, that it looked like even in the rabbi, even in Isaiah that I'm making mention to, one of the most powerful prophets in the word, had wounding in their souls. But therefore, at times when we're crushed, when we're broken, that's when we're fit. That's when we're vessels fit for his use. That's 
when he deems us as righteous and vessels of honor, not what we would think to be perfect in our own might. So Mary's then what are we striving for? Are we striving for perfection? What would that look like for us to say that I am perfected? And that now my soul has been healed in every area and it aligns with my redeemed spirit. From our concept, from our mindsets and from what we can wrap our minds around, would that look like a soul that is fit for his use, that has now been repaired with no signs of ever hemorrhaging, with no signs of ever being broken, with no signs of ever being hurt, with no signs of ever having an unclean life. All right, let's move. Let's process this, Mary's. Now, as I move through it, there are some things I'm not going to touch, but some things I will that just stood out to me as we summarize this that really sets the tone for me to go into the activity group for the chapter three. And it says here, the author says, our true problem lies not in being wounded, pause, because the reason why we're studying this, right, is because we said that we have areas of our life, of our soul, that have been wounded. But the author says our true problem lies not in being wounded, but in whether or not we are willing to be healed. What does that healing process look like to God? And are we even open to be obedient to receive what he wants to do in us and how he wants to produce the healing? Or do we just want to get out of pain? Or are we ready to just alleviate the pain? All right. But God actually uses our wounds to give us wisdom and to equip us to bring light into the dark. He uses our wounding to give us wisdom and to equip us to bring light into the darkness. And the author, Joyce Meyer, she has these little boxes out to the side that you see and that's where you stop. That's a point I would say to ponder. The problem lies not in being wounded but in whether or not we are willing to be healed. And so can we then stand to even be healed? Can we even stand to go through the process of, of asking the Lord to do what he deems fit, to look at our lives and look at the sin, whether it be from iniquitous patterns, whether it be from an ancestral line, but let's bring that right back to us. Are we willing to deal with some things in our lives that have caused us to be wounded? And are we willing then to allow God in in a way that our flesh, because King, Uz King Uzziah, rather, he was a type of obstruction or flesh. He was a good king, but symbolically, he was in the way, and he looked like flesh. He looked like an altar. He looked like an obstruction to Isaiah's view. So if we look at some things in our soul, if we look at some things in our hearts, our mind, our will, and our emotions, what would be our Uzziah that would obstruct our view. What would be that thing that we don't want God to touch that would keep us from truly being healed? So the problem lies not in being wounded, but in whether or not we are willing to be healed. Okay. And it says here, and then it, it just went further where, uh, 
Brianna Manning said, in the futile attempt to erase our past, we deprive community of our healing gift. So then we tend to hide our afflictions. We don't want people to see that we've been wounded at some point. We don't want them to see our limp. Because what I hear them saying in this, even as we get started in, in, in what I was processing as I was studying and preparing for it, that God wants the wounded because the wounding equips us to bring light into the darkness. Because the world in essence is wounded and we've been called to the world. So if we don't have evidence of scars, then how would they be able to relate to the process of healing that God brought us through and how he desired to bring that healing to us? So Brianna Manning said, in the futile attempt to erase our past, we deprive community of healing, of our healing gift. If we conceal our wounds out of fear and shame, our inner darkness can neither be illumina illuminated nor become a light for others. And as we go through this process, Marys, we love it when you share because as we're sitting at the feet of Jesus, we went through the battlefield of the mind to get us to a place where we understood that there were areas of our characters that were demonized because of mind binding spirits, strongholds, etc. That would even prepare us to come to a place where a question could be asked to us, are we willing to be healed? Are we willing to allow God into that place that maybe we would then want to blame shift or maybe we've been holding that thing in or we've been hiding it because we've been ashamed of our past and what caused the wounding or if it was because of sin or even our own sin that caused the oozing, that caused the pain, that caused our souls to be uh, in despair, to cause our souls to be wounded. But are we willing to even allow others in to see the process of the healing, to see the process? And even once we receive the healing, are we willing then to even share that with others? Because God wants the wounded. Okay? So it says, if we conceal our wounds out of fear and shame, our inner darkness can neither be illuminated nor become a light for others. God wants soldiers in his army who have allowed him to heal their wounded souls. No matter who has rejected you in the past, I can assure you, and this is the author speaking, I can assure you that Jesus will never reject you. If you have either felt that God could never use you because of your past Consider what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And it says, for simply consider your own call, brethren. Not many of you were considered to be wise according to human estimates and standards. Not many influential and powerful. Not many of high and noble birth according to 1 Corinthians 1.26. And then she said here, and, and when I think of that, and I think of the call, because even Paul said that he had a thorn of affliction in his side and he asked God to remove it over and over, but he, wouldn't, he, he didn't move the thorn in his flesh. And most of us, we, we don't know. People speculate, scholars speculate what the thorn in his flesh was. But you imagine that that thorn in your flesh is something that God wants to use as a part of your ministry when we're Marcus. And when I looked at that and I said, okay, God, so what then does that look like for me? And he said, just what you always say and just exactly what you're doing. Your misery is your ministry. And your message, your mess, that that has caused you to be wounded 
and that's now a part of your ministry now becomes your message. And a lot of times out of fear, out of shame, we want to hide those things because we don't want others to see that we've been broken. But behind the door, we want God to heal us in those places, make us like brand new in our own mind, whatever we can wrap our minds around that would tell us that's what that looks like to relieve the pain. And when we are ministering to others out of that place of wounding, that God has said to us, look, I've clothed you in righteousness and I have called you for such a time as this. And I desire that you use this, yes, that, as a part of your message and a part of your ministry. That place that's within you that have been wounded, that have been broken. I want to use that as a part of the message to others. Are you willing to be healed so that you can then use this as your ministry, that you can use this as your message? Are you willing? Okay. So when he said that in the book, when she, and she brought that to light from that 1 Corinthians 1 26, that made me think of that. And then I would have to then further say Mary's, what does that look like for you? Are you willing to be used in the place where you've been broken? Yes, we want to be healed, but only God can do it. And in whatever way he deems fit, are we willing to be healed in that place the way the Lord deems fit? And then further it said, and I'm on page 20 now, for the Lord sees not... For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that's according to 1 Samuel 16 and 7 and 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 28. And it says, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 28, uh, 28. No, for God selected deliberately chose what in the world is foolish to put wise, the wise to shame? And what the world calls weak to put the strong to shame? And God also selected, deliberately chose, that means very strategically chose, what in the world is lowborn and insignificant and branded and treated with contempt even the things that are nothing, that he might depose and bring to nothing the things that are. And when I think of that, I look at how it says here, uh, the author making reference to that passage of scripture that God deliberately chose those who have been wounded to work in his kingdom, in his army. He works through their wounds and weaknesses and people see their power. And what came to mind in that as we continue to read, he, he, she was making reference to being qualified for a position. And the way the world qualifies it, you is that they want you to have certain credentials. But God, on the other hand, he qualifies the called. He doesn't call the qualified. So even in our wounding and even in those broken places, he wants us to renew our minds. He wants our Uzziahs to die, which represents our flesh, that that is blocking our view of him, that that is keeping us from seeing exactly the way he wants us to see, but that that would keep us in a place to say, because I don't feel that I'm qualified, because of the things I'm currently going through, because of the brokenness and the wounding in my soul from, from nature, from nurture, from things that were thrust up on me or things that I did myself that separated me from God in a way because of sin, which caused my soul, my, uh, soul to be wounded then I wouldn't be qualified for this. Or even if I shared with others, or I then uh, used that that have caused me pain as in misery, 
as a part of ministry, maybe that's not something I'm ready to share with the world. Can you do it a different way, God? Can you do it a different way? Or can you then, Lord, just hold off on that and allow me then to get the training, to get, you know, the credentials or to get the degrees or to get this, that, and the other, or the rehabilitation before you use me? Can you heal me in my entirety so that people can't see my limp before you use me? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. But God deliberately chooses those who have been wounded to work in his kingdom, in his army. He works through their wounds and weaknesses and people see his power. They see his power because even in this scripture, then it says that what he says in that uh, first Corinthians 1 27 through 28 no for god selected deliberately chose what in the world that is foolish to put the wise to shame and what the world calls weak to put the strong to shame and moving further in this it says as you put your trust in god the day may come when even the people who hurt you will witness the mighty things that God has done in your life and through and through you as an instrument. And even in him using us as his instrument, as his vessels of honor, in our minds, we would probably perceive a vessel of honor as a vessel that is shiny, that has no dents, that has no cracks, that has no oozes, that has no calluses, that has no bruises, that would be perfect. And what we call perfect and how we deem that to look and what we think the world would accept. But how about, and you will we'll get to this when we do the activity, because in the activity, there's a place where we're asked to draw a picture or uh, or an illustration of what we would think what God, when he chooses the wounded, what that would look like, or as an individual that's qualified. So in my mind, what I saw was a crackpot. And many years ago, um, I saw, there's actually a story about a crackpot and how the crackpot was down on itself and it didn't think that it was fit for the purpose that it was called to because it saw so many perfect vessels that didn't have the crack or didn't have the wound, okay? That didn't have the imperfections. So the crackpot felt that it couldn't be used. But the crackpot kept going. And we'll illustrate this on next week. Kept going. And then out of what came, the, the ministry or the anointing that came out of that crack pot created a beautiful forest or beautiful fortress. That in itself is one of the symbolisms for me I look at as the crack pot. And that was the first thing that came to mind. But when we often think of a vessel that has been healed, that has been restored and that is fit for God's use. We think of a shiny, pretty vessel with no dents, with no bruises, right? But God is saying something different in this chapter three about what that looks like. And I think mayors, and this would be a good time as we continue to move through this uh, summary of this chapter to assess now and reassess what a vessel of honor to God looks like. And it looks like to me, one that has been wounded. One that's not perfect or perfection in man's eyes or what we perceive man calls perfection. And that's because flesh, our Uzziah 
has been in the way of what God wants to show us. All right? So are we willing to be healed? in the way that God chooses to heal us? Are we willing to even be used in the process of being healed? Are we willing to allow other people to see it? Because even in uh, that chapter one, and we were able to get through the activity, it was a pretty long uh, chapter, that chapter one. So it was about two hours, you'd have to really you know, get to the second hour to really to see the activity part of it. But in the activity part of that, in the workbook, I was speaking to some things where I noticed that I had wounding in my soul. And the enemy wanted to tell me that I shouldn't have made reference to the fact that I felt, because there were questions that were asked of us, that I should have made reference to what came to mind when I thought about women. Well, I've been wounded in that area before. So then the first thing that came to mind, not about the women that love me, like you, Marys, not about, you know, the, the friends that I have, that God have blessed me with that have never hurt me. But the first thing I thought was about individuals that were mean, that were callous, that were evil, that were just waiting for, not when they would hurt you, but, you know, if they would hurt you, but when they would hurt you. Then it asked a question about how do you view men? What came up was that men will hurt you. They will reject you. They'll cause you pain. Fear of man, man in some way. And I had to assess myself and I shared that. And the enemy wanted to tell me that wasn't good to share. You needed to hide that and only share that that would look like a vessel of honor that had been healed in every way, that would be pristine, that would be shiny and pretty, but not a crackpot. Because you sound like a crackpot right now by saying that and sharing that. But the Lord said, keep digging deeper. As you move into chapter three, then you're going to see that your willingness to be obedient and to even be like Isaiah and say, my God, I'm a man. I'm a woman of unclean lips. I'm broken. I'm a crackpot. I'm wounded. But can you still use me? I know that you called me, God, and maybe you was calling the one behind me. I'm not qualified for this. I'm broken. I'm battered. I'm bruised. I've been trampled on. I'm damaged goods. He said, keep pushing. Daughter, I've qualified the called. And I don't often call those that are already qualified. So I said, okay, God. So being what the world might deem as a crackpot, wounded, broken, battered, bruised, oozing, you can still find something in me that you choose to use. And I said, Lord, okay. So then I had to tell that spirit of self, of shame, of fear of man's opinion, or who might hear it and think that I'm not qualified and fit for the journey, or even fit to facilitate healing the soul of a woman. He said, now Uzziah have to die so you can see me high and lifted up on the throne and that my glory 
and my train will fill your temple so that you are fit, a vessel that I have deemed fit for use in my kingdom. Daughter, I've called the wounded. Therefore, I have called you. All right? <laughs> We moving. And our prayer, Mary's, is that you're taking note and that you're allowing God to recalibrate your mind in what you thought that should look like. Because what it looks like for us, Mary's, when we're sitting at his feet, he's bringing truth and revelation knowledge. But what is it that's getting in the way of what he wants to show us? And how he wants to use us when we're Martha's. Or are we waiting for that perfect time? When we receive the, the credentials or the qualifications or the world has affirmed us. Before we will allow him to use us just as we are. Are we willing to be healed in the process and still be used? and allow others, other Marys, and other individuals that he has called us to, our family members, our friends, etc., to see that we've been broken, to see that we've been battered, to see that we've been bruised, to see that we are in pain. But then say, but can you see then the hand of God on my life as he transforms Forms me as he transformed this wounded, bruised, battered, traumatized soul into the likeness of my redeemed spirit. Can you see the hand of God on my life? Can you see him through me and me, high and lifted up, sitting on his throne? because he chose to use a crackpot like me. All right, let's keep moving, Marys. So as you put your trust in God, this is the author speaking, as you put your trust in God, the day may come when even the people who hurt you will witness the mighty things that God has done in your life and through you as his instrument. And I paused there again because the first thing you wanna think is that, yeah, they're gonna see how God elevated me. They're gonna see how he's using me in his kingdom. But he reminded me that when they see those individuals that hurt me and that I'm still willing to go back and I'm still willing to minister to them in, their, in that place where they've been wounded and they've been battered and they've been bruised because hurt people hurt people, that he would then use me to be the light to help facilitate the healing that they need, the deliverance that they need, the restoration that they need, and that they can then see God high and lifted up in my life. Not to bring them guilt, shame, and reproach to their lives, but so that they could then seek for God and seek for his hand and say, if you can use her, even after the things I know I did to this individual, I know how it traumatized their life, but God if you can bring the good, the precious out of the vow in their life that even I know I attribute it to. Father, I repent. Can you use me? Can you heal me? Can you then allow me to be a crack pot? that you can use for your glory. Unique, individually chosen, deliberately chosen for your glory. 
not so that person then could could then experience guilt or shame or fear or reproach or then we could feel that we are then transcended above or beyond them or we are then exalting being exalted above these individuals that we feel like that that have caused us pain but that they would then see God and turn and repent that the the Uzziahs in their life that represents their flesh would be gross leveled so that they could see God. All right. Being experienced, moving on, Marys, being experienced is a benefit, but getting the experience is painful. Instead of thinking about how much you have gone through in life that has been painful, why not think about all the experience that you now have and all the opportunities that are before you as God's daughters. And again, being reminded that most oftentimes, Mary's, our mess becomes a huge part of our message. And our misery most oftentimes become a huge part that misery, <laughs> yeah, I pause there. Because when you think of mess and you think of misery, you think of woundedness. Our misery becomes a huge part, most oftentimes, a part of our ministry. And if, for some reason, those that you have been called to when you're Martha's, even if it's your family, they're not able to see beyond the mask. They're not able to see beyond the pretty shiny vessel to that place where you have a limp, that place where you've been calloused, that place where you've been wounded, and maybe you still have that limp a bit. Then maybe you need to reassess. We, Marys, need to reassess what that looks like when we've been called to do things for God. All right. All right. Okay. Being experienced is a benefit, but getting the experience is painful. Instead of thinking about how much you have gone through in life that has been painful, why not think about all the experience that you now have? and all the opportunities that are before you as God's daughters, as his marriage. Remember, with God, there is no rejects. That's why Jesus said, he who believes in him, who clings to, trusts in, relies on him, is not judged. He who trusts in him never comes up for judgment. He deems righteous whom he deems righteous. He covers and cloaks us and hides us in his quiver. He clothes us in righteousness, not man. For him, there is no rejection, no condemnation. He incurs no damnation, according to John, St. John 3 and 18. If you were to apply for a job, and this is the author, she's just talking about the experiences. If you were to apply for a job, one question that is guaranteed to be on your application is, how much experience do you have? The employer will probably be interested in your level of education. But if two people apply who are equally educated and one has experience in the area, they are applying to work in and the other one doesn't the more experienced worker will almost certainly get the job and i underlined what i'm about to to read to you next experience gives us something that nothing else can 
So when we think of our lives, Marys, and everything that we have gone through, the sum total of our, our mind, our willingness, our emotions, everything that it encompasses, our life experiences, our encounters, our nurture, our nature, that's a part of our experiences. And all of that then directs us to what it is that God wants to use us for as Martha's. And if we are Martha's and we're being used in that manner and we weren't quite sure, then this is the time to rest assured that this is exactly how God deems fit to use us. And these are the things that he is using us for. And if we know that we are doing something that is not in the will of God. And we know it's, it's something that we've done in our flesh. Our Uzziah have operated in pride and we're not allowing God to use the place, the wounded places in us that he's healed and he's deemed us as righteous as he has clothed us, clothed us in righteousness, as he has washed us with his. Then we need to go back and reassess what we even believe our purpose is. Do we believe that the healing is coming forth in our lives so that we can get relief? Or is it for the advancement of his kingdom? Right, Marys? Okay, ponder that. Experience gives us, and I underline this, experience gives us something that nothing else can. We learn by God's word and by life's experiences. And look at Proverbs 3 and 13. And Proverbs 3 and 13 just says here, it simply says this. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Proverbs 3 and 13 says, happy, blessed, considered fortunate to be admired is the man or the Mary, who finds skillful and godly wisdom, and the man who gains understanding and insight, learning from God's word and life's experiences. It's easy to talk about a thing, but only experience makes what we say worth listening to. So people need to see what we've been through. They need to be able to relate to it. So when we then ask God, why me? Why am I going through all of this? Why have I experienced all of this? Why have I been so hard pressed on every hand? Why is this the hand I've been dealt? Why me, God? Why did I have to be broken, battered, and wounded, and bruised in these places that have often, most oftentimes caused me shame? or have caused me to fear or feel inadequate or feel unworthy. That's a sum total of our life experiences and there's nothing that will go to waste, but he's going to use it all. He's going to use it all for the advancement of his kingdom, but are we willing to allow him to use it even in the process of being healed? Mary's. So this may not quite look like what we thought it was going to look like when we think of our souls being healed. The healing the soul of a woman. Okay, because I could keep going. I'm going to move. I'm going to keep moving, Mary's. Experience gives us something that nothing else can. We learn by God's word and by life's experiences. It's easy to talk about a thing, but only experience makes what we say worth listening to. The world is filled with people who judge what they know nothing about and attempt to educate people regarding what they have never experienced. And she then highlighted in the little, book, the little box out to the side I would say that that's our point to ponder there, right? It's easy to talk, but only experience makes what we say worth listening to. Mary's, 
It's not about what we say. And that's why it's so important for us. And you notice, Minister Sarah and I, we go through the process with you. We never say that we're just minister. There's no way that we can minister and facilitate without sitting at his feet, without going through it. And I promise you, every chapter, even thus far in the introduction, I was dealing with some things and he was dealing with some things in this process of healing to the point where there's times where I stop and I say, do I even want to go further? Because I know this is going to do some things in me. But the question that was asked, am I willing to go through what it takes to be healed? And not as the world deems healing, not as the world deems restoration but how God deems healing and restoration. And then be that living sacrifice, that walking oracle that doesn't look perfect to the world, willing to be used. And if we look at everything that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary for us, everything that he experienced, even when he came, he was born in a manger. They looked for him to come in a, be, to be, I guess, be born in a palace because they knew that, I, that, that our king, that our savior was coming. They never expected for him to come and be born in a manger and be the son of a carpenter. Okay, I'm gonna have to keep moving there. I gotta keep moving. Listen, Marys. It's easy to talk but only experience makes what we say worth listening to. Reassess, Marys, whether the sum total of your experiences, your hurts, your habits, your hangups, all that you have gone through. Reassess, are you really using that that has been your mess as a part of your message, or, or have you been ashamed of it? So now you're on as, a, as a, a, a Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus saying, well, I want to be healed so that I don't have to share that part of my life. I want to suppress that. I want that to go away. I want to click my heels three times, click, click, click like Dorothy, and I'm home and it's, everything is perfect. Or does he want to use that that you have experienced, the good, the bad, the ugly, and then that ugly, ugly, <laughs> that behind the door and the back and the boot and the den and the dark stuff. Do he want to use that? Are you going to allow him to use it? Or are you going to say, mm, 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 God, something else. Assess Mary's. Because what I'm hearing here is easy to talk, but only experience makes what we say worth listening to. Will you be able to walk it out? Will you be able to show? Will, you, will it reflect in you? Will you be a, will we, Mary, can we stand it? Can we stand to be healed? Can we stand to allow others to see our brokenness? Can we stand to allow him to see the glory and for him to get the glory out of our lives? Because most oftentimes we'll say it and I look at it in a different way because I'll always say, I say, Lord, get the glory. As long as you get the glory. That means something different to me now, Marys. That means that my Uzziah must die so that I can give him the glory so that my flesh won't get in the way. And then indeed he uses everything huh, in me to advance his kingdom. Okay. It's easy to talk, but only experience makes what we say worth listening to. I'm moving because there's other stuff, but I'm going to move. We are prone, and I'm on page 22, we are prone to despising the painful things 
we have gone through in life. Listen at that, Marys. We are prone to despising the painful things we have gone through in life, but God can use them to help others if we will let him. And here's the deal with that, Marys. Our process of deliverance from mind-binding spirits of fear, guilt, shame, worthlessness, hiding, is so that we will allow our lives to be an open book because there is someone that needs it. And God wants to use it to help while he's healing us, bring that healing and deliverance to others. Are we willing? Are we willing? We are prone to despising the painful things we have gone through in life, but God can use them to help others if we will let him. And this is the author speaking. She says, and all of this is her speaking other than what I'm sharing with you based on when I pause. And I, I underlined and I highlighted this. She said, I don't for one second, listen, Marys, I don't for one second believe that God arranged for my abuse so he could give me some experience. But I do believe that he has used my experience to help other people. And he will do the same thing with your experience in life. Now, if you don't know Joyce Meyer's uh, story, please go back. You can, you can go on uh, YouTube and you can Google it. Uh, she speaks to it in this book a bit. But most oftentimes, most of us, we probably know her story, but you can go you know, and Google it. And you, she speaks to the, uh, the abuse, the physical and sexual abuse that she experienced at the hands of her father. And even her mother knew about it. Listen, these are things that this, this mighty woman of God laid bare to the world. This is a true example of allowing your mess to become your message and your misery to become your ministry. And I pause there. Because a lot of times we're seeking for the healing, we're seeking for the deliverance so that we can get relief or so that we can look perfect to the world. But if this woman of God was not willing to share the abuse, the hurt, the pain, the fragmentation, that that would look like a crack, a, a crack pot to bring healing and deliverance so that we can sit here and receive what we need from the Lord and then be willing. Can we stand to be healed and pay it forward, Marys, when we're Martha's? That's why we're here. So I think we need to reassess what that's supposed to look like, Marys. She said, I don't for one second believe that God arranged for my abuse so that he could give me some experience. But I do believe that he has used my experience to help other people. And he will do the same thing with your experience in life. And I can then attest to that. I can attest to the fact that even being on and helping facilitate a women's ministry that brings reconciliation, that the goal is to, through biblical study and teaching, to bring reconciliation and healing to the heart, the mind, the, the, the soul of a woman is not because I just decided that this was something that I'd like to do and teach on with no experience. I have battle wounds that God is using as he qualifies me to sit and be used to help facilitate and be a vessel of honor that don't look like a shiny pot that has never been touched, but a can that has been damaged, but still fit for his use. 
Okay, Mary's. Okay, Mary's. <laughs> All right. All right. God uses everyone who is willing to be used by him. Hmm. Willing. Mind, will, and emotions. Are you willing? to surrender? Are you willing to yield it to him? Are there mind-binding spirits, shame, guilt, fear, inadequacy, unworthiness, rebellion, disobedience, blockages that would keep you from being willing, that would keep you from surrendering, that would keep you from being that vessel of honor that don't look like that, that we thought it should look like, that shiny vessel with no cracks and no flaws or no defects. Hmm. All right. God uses everyone who is willing to be used by him, but there are a few positions in the kingdom, and this is the author speaking, but there are a few positions in the kingdom work that only the experience can feel. And I would say, <laughs> listen, there's only a few positions in kingdom work that only the experienced can feel. And I would say those of us that have turned our mind, our will, and our emotions over to the Lord so that he can get the glory out of our lives and everything that we have experienced, nature and nurture. None of it took him by surprise. All that Satan thought that he would destroy us with, God said that I will take the precious out of this vile life, out of the darkness of this soul, and I will then use it for my glory. And I will syncopate it with a redeemed spirit where the light of my love will flourish in a place where people thought that it was barren, uh, that, there, there, that it could never uh, encompass light. But listen, he made a decision deliberately, methodically to say, yeah, I'm going to take that so that the world can see that, that that they thought could never be fit for use or good for anything is what I am going to bring light to the world. That's how I'm going to uh, recalibrate the hearts, the minds, and the souls of individuals, not just the Marys, but individuals that have been broken, that have been battered, that have been bruised. Because I know in this life that have been broken, that have been battered, that have been bruised, Everything that is not like me, this individual is willing to sacrifice it and give, and give it up. And say, Lord, if you can find anything in me, use me, Lord. Even now, in the condition, my current posture is I'm dead in you. I am yours. I belong to you. But Everything that's in me, I feel like, I, listen, I don't feel like I'm fit. But he says that if you give it up, if you die, if you surrender, and if you let me have it, then I will use you for my glory, my train. My glory will fill the temple. We are the temple. I will fill you. I will cleanse you. I will purge you. I will put a hot coal to your mouth. And I will renew you. I will make you whole again. Fit for my use. All right. God uses everyone who is willing to be used by him. But there are a few positions in kingdom work that only the experienced can feel. If someone is hurting, it is very frustrating and useless to try to talk to someone about it if they can plainly see that the person 
has no practical idea what they are going through. When we are hurting, we need empathy and the person to give us, to give us that is that someone who has been where we are. So when we are hurting, we need empathy and the best person to give us that someone who has been where we are. And again, Mary's that takes us back to making sure that as you are engaging in this healing the soul of a woman, and you know that you're a, a, a moth is because we know that as uh, a part of the kingdom of God, as his daughters, that it's all about the reconciliation. The overarching purpose is the advancement of his kingdom and in, in in the overarching purpose, reconciling souls back to the kingdom of God. That means that we're not our own. But if at some juncture or we have been, or we misunderstood that the healing process is for him to then be able to use us in whatever condition he decides to use us in and not so that we can then get just relief and show to the world that we look perfect but so that he can then get the glory out of our lives and that we then recognize and come to the end of ourselves and understand that as kingdom citizens, as, as conduits of his spirit, that it's not about us, but it's about the advancement of his kingdom. Are we willing, Mary's, to allow him to use even that? Even that. Okay. What qualifies, and this is at the bottom of page 22, what qualifies Jesus to help us? What qualifies him to help us? And I thought that was interesting for her to start that that way, right? And she says, your initial reaction to that question might be, well, Joyce, he is the son of God, <laughs> right? I mean, just immediately, that's what we would think, right? But she said here, she says, doesn't that qualify him? Because he's the son of God, right? She said, but the Bible says that Jesus, and I underlined this and highlighted it. But the Bible says that Jesus chose to experience our pain. Although he was a son, he learned active special obedience through what he suffered. And he completed experience, making him perfectly equipped. He became the author and source of eternal salvation to all those who give heed and obey him. And that's according to Hebrews 5, 8 through 9. And that to me was interesting because it then reminded me of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And as conduits of his spirit and as kingdom citizens, knowing that we are not our own, when we receive Jesus Christ into our heart as our Lord and Savior, then we gave up our rights to want to continue to live or I mean, we can do it because he's given us free will. But when we receive salvation, it's not just about securing our fire insurance and then going back and living like hell or living like the world, or doing it our way, and only coming to him when we get wounded from the separation that sin causes from him in the earth, or to keep on sinning like Paul said, God forbid, that's not what grace is for. <laughs> that's not what grace is for, is to keep on sinning, but the grace of God is for us to bring everything that's in us and lay it at his feet and say, God, if there's anything in me that you can use, here I am, use me, God. And I thank you for Holy Spirit. And I thank you for your grace, the grace that's been imputed to me that is sufficient for me to carry out 
and do all that you have called me to do, to follow the blueprint that Jesus uh, left for us in his earthly ministry. To count it all joy when we go through diverse trials and tribulation and temptation, when we go through things that cause us to be hurt, when we go through things that, uh, that we would want to say, I want to throw in the towel, when we go through certain things that, that's not so lovely, that's not so kind, but when we look at what Jesus did, he left the blueprint. He provided a way of escape and he provided his grace so that we could endure it. And his blood heals. His blood redeems. His blood restores. His blood brings wholeness to our souls so that we can then Take up our marching orders and do what he's called us to do in the earth. Right, Mary's? That's where it is. So what qualified Jesus to help us is because Jesus chose to experience our pain. He chose to experience our pain. He lived this life, but he did it without sin. And, and, and as we go further, and, and she says here, I highlighted this part of it on page 23. Jesus needed experience in order to be our high priest so that he could truly say that he understood our pain. My experience with Jesus, and this is the author saying, her experience with Jesus is healing power qualifies her to boldly tell others that Jesus will heal their wounded souls just as he has done hers. So can we say the same, Marys? Knowing that we're here, we're in this Bible study, healing the soul of a woman, what was our expectations? Again, was it to get the relief? Or was it to understand now processing that it is about his healing power being able to use us for his glory, knowing that we are not our own, but we belong to him. So knowing that our experiences with Jesus is our, as well, Mary's experiences with Jesus' healing power qualifies us as well to boldly tell others that Jesus will heal their wounds and heal their souls. Okay, now moving on, Marys. God is good, and therefore, and I move down to the bottom, I highlighted this in that last paragraph. God is good, and therefore, he can take what Satan intended for harm and work it out for our good, and the good of others who need it and who need help. We are soldiers in God's mighty army, but instead of putting his soldiers who are wounded in the hospital, he actually promotes them into positions of greater power and influence. And then she just spoke to Moses' situation. She said, when Moses reached a point in his life where he needed help, God told him to find wise, understanding, experienced and respected men and promote them. And she gave scriptural reference there, that Deuteronomy 1 and 13. She says, I urge you at this moment to offer your experience to God for his use if you have never done that. So in this place, Mary's, even where you're saying, look, we're only in chapter three, and I'm not quite sure that I'm ready for this because indeed I'm wounded. Well, it says God, wants the wounded. And understand this, Marys, that in the process of yielding everywhere you've been hurt, everywhere you've been broken, everywhere you've been wounded, in the process of yielding your experiences, everything that you have gone through to God, that he will heal you. 
and that even in the process of yielding, if you even just stop now and say, I yield to you, God. Every place I've been hurt, even that, the process of healing is being manifest right now. He's doing it even now, even that. He's healing even now. And then she spoke further. She said, I vividly recall saying to God, I am a broken mess, but I'm yours if you can use me. And he did. Can we Mary stop and say, God, I'm a broken mess, but I'm yours if you can use me. And then further, she said, anything we give to God will never be wasted. He takes the broken pieces of our lives make into, and he makes beautiful things. He gives us beauty for ashes. He gives us beauty for ashes. And it says further that Elizabeth Elliot said, of one thing I am perfectly sure, God's story never ends with ashes. And then in the little italicized place, she said, God's story never ends with ashes. So that's something to ponder on. Everything that we've gone through, everything that we've experienced, just know in the end of the thing is reconciliation, it's healing, it's restoration, and it's beauty for ashes. Not as the world deems beauty, not as the world sees fit but the way God deems fit. And that statement, she said, that statement touched me deeply and gives me hope. We may begin with ashes, but when, he give, but when, but when we give them to Jesus, he makes something beautiful. Don't let your pain be wasted by being bitter and resentful throughout life because you feel that you have been unjustly treated. Instead, make your experiences a valuable tool for helping others. God gave the word to Isaiah to give the people who were in fear because of the painful things they were going through. And this is the word, behold, I will make you to be a new sharp threshing instrument, which has teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them, to beat them small and shall make the hills like chaff. You shall win now them and the wind shall carry them away and the tempest or whirlwind shall scatter them and you shall rejoice in the Lord. You shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. The poor needy are seeking water when there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. And that's according to Isaiah 41, 15 and 17. And further she said, if you read this carefully, you will see that God promises to take and turn you into a valuable tool that he can, that can be used to help those who are seeking help. So he'll turn you into a tool. A tool. He'll turn you into a, a bow and arrow. He'll turn you even if it's a crackpot that he can use for his glory and that he can use to confound even the wise that he can use to take down and gross level the enemy and every enemy of your life and those that he has called you to. And let me just keep moving, Marys, and, and let's just, let's move on. Sanctified experiences, that's on page 25. Sanctified experiences, what does that look like? That looks like being set apart, set apart. that looks like being purged that looks like being holy. 
set apart for his use. And it says further, and I'm going to read um, Isaiah 6, 1 through 7, because that sanctified experiences is exactly what Isaiah experienced when his flesh, that that was blocking his view of God and who God truly was, was gross leveled in his life when King Uzziah died sanctified experiences and she said further here in the book before i read that the psalmist david spoke about sanctified experiences that he had in psalms 119 and 7 the word sanctified me set apart for god's use consecrated or declared holy the painful and unjust things that happens to us in life don't come from god but he can sanctify them for his own use. And she said further, I love this thought. Satan is our true enemy. And in reality, he is behind all of our pain and suffering. But by letting God sanctify those pains and use them to help others, we have found the secret of overcoming evil with good, according to Romans 12:21. And then she went further to say, and if you don't like what the devil has done in your life or the destruction he has caused, then don't play into his hands by being resentful, angry, and filled with self-pity. And I know that if you, you tracked with us with the battlefield of the mind, then you understand that a lot of things that, that will keep us that's in our flesh, mind-binding spirits, they're demons. They're demons that will keep us from seeing God's glory. There are demons that will keep our Uzziah from dying. And our flesh will block the glory of God and all that he has for us. What would that look like? That will, will look like resentment. That would look like anger. And that would look like self-pity. And further, she said, instead, instead, let God sanctify your pain. And you will see the fulfillment of the scripture that says the enemy may come against you one way, but he will flee before you in seven ways. Deuteronomy 28 and 7. And it says further, you no longer, and I underline this, you no longer have to spend your life running from the pain of your past. You can put the devil, your true enemy, on the run. Many different types of things happen to women that wound their souls, but none of them need to be wasted. And then she just gave a short list of some things that wound us. And that looks like, and this is on page, the bottom of page 25, Mary's moving over to 26. She says, many different types of things happen to women that wound their souls, but none of them need to be wasted. None of them need to be wasted. None of them need to be wasted. Here's a short list of some of the things that wound us. Abuse of any kind, being bullied, being battered by a violent spouse, an unfaithful husband, death of a child or spouse, long-term illness, divorce, divorce, stress of being a caregiver, rejection, being marginalized by a parent, spouse, friend, or employer, betrayal of a friend, being the subject of gossip or lies, a child who is ill or in pain, a loved one who is following a destructive path in life, prejudice, being the victim of crime, inability to have children, inability to meet the expectations of others, struggles with weight, acne, or some other physical imperfections, feeling like you are never enough, never smart enough, pretty enough, or good enough. Any of these violations can be redeemed by God and used for his glory. Now this, I wouldn't say, is an exhaustive list of violations of the enemy. Of, of trespasses against us or even some things that we've done to others. It's not an exhaustive list, but the blessing and the beauty, Marys, is that 
any of these violations and even those that Holy Spirit may reveal to you can be redeemed by God and used for his glory. There is nothing that has hurt you that can scar you for life. There is nothing that you can that you cannot recover from and nothing that God cannot heal. And the, the, the point to ponder there in bold over to the side is there is nothing that God cannot heal. Now, I wanna share with you, because I said that I would share that Isaiah, um, six one through seven and i'm reading from the amplified version okay mirrors and it just speaks to when king uzziah died and he again he was he was really uh symbolic of an obstacle that was in isaiah's way and isaiah was a mighty prophet but he still had a a a, a blockage or almost like uh, King Uzziah, if we would say a type of um, idol almost, because he looked to King Uzziah. So he couldn't even really fulfill fully everything that God had called him to do as a mouthpiece because King Uzziah was still alive and he was a good king. In essence, I mean, he had stuff that he did because he actually died because he had touched the uh, the the covenant, the uh, what do you call it, the altar of covenant. He touched it. He he tried to keep it from falling, falling, and he died <laughs> because the Lord struck him. His anger was kindled against him. But that was because he felt like he could go into places and do things that the Lord had not given him permission to do. And sometimes pride can do that. The Ark of the Covenant, that's what I was looking for. The Ark of the Covenant. And there were some other things that he did that showed that he kind of started feeling himself, himself. And he was a good king, right? But Isaiah couldn't really do the things that God wanted him to do until his Uzziah died. And that's our flesh. Obstacles in the way. Could it be some of the mind binding spirits? Could it be some of the demons that we've been dealing with of guilt and shame and fear and unworthiness or pride or rebellion or et cetera that are standing in the way? that are keeping us from seeing and doing what the Lord wants us to do and even recognizing how God wants to bring forth that deliverance. Because it may not just be about some things that people have done to us. It could be familiarity. It could be so many things. But let's read this and just take a look at that. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7, the Amplified Version, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, this is Isaiah speaking, he said, I saw in a vision the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, with the train of his royal robe filling the most holy part of the temple. Above him, seraphim, heavenly beings stood. Each one had six wings. With two wings, he covered his face. With two wings he covered his feet and with two wings he flew and and one called out to another saying holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is filled with his glory and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out and the temple was filled with smoke then i said Whoa, this is Isaiah. He said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of ceremonially unclean lips. And I live among people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, 
with a burning coal in his hand, which had taken, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it and said, listen carefully. This has touched your lips, your wickedness, your sin, your injustice, your wrongdoing is taken away and your sin atoned for and forgiven. That in itself, and then it, it goes further to speak to then once King Uzziah died and then I, uh, Isaiah could then see God for who he really was beyond his flesh and beyond what the world deemed was righteous at that time. He was then able to be used by God, but even in that, he realized that there were some things in him that wasn't right. And a lot of times, Mary's, our healing will come through renunciations, repentance, and asking for forgiveness. Not looking at the things that have wounded our souls that are kept us from God or kept us in a certain place or a certain stance as something that someone else did to us. Because if you look at Isaiah, he said, woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And this is a man that, this is a prophet, a great prophet. He's been scribing, he's been ministering, he's been being used as a mouthpiece for God. But he really could not be used in full and he really could not be purged until the flesh died. That's when he was able to see the glory of God in his life. And then the glory of God then produced the healing in his life. And sometimes that hot coal is not going to feel good. So if you think, if we think that the healing process is going to be one that's going to be easy or that it may feel good, it may be like the hot coal because there may be some things that he needs to deal with in our flesh that will actually bring the healing to our souls. Okay, Mary's. Okay, I'm going to stop right there with that. Because we are, are really at time and I still had a, a little more. But let me just cover the marked life, okay? The marked, the uh, marked for life, and it says here, abuse can be sexual, emotional, mental, or physical. Abuse of any kind, any kind is damaging, but it is said that sexual violation is the most destructive to a woman's soul. Physical, emotional, or sexual child abuse is said to mark women's brains in certain patterns. And I know she made mention of this because if you know her story, she was sexually abused. And so, Marys, I would say in whatever way that you have been wounded, emotionally, mentally, or physically, it doesn't even have to be direct. It could be indirect trauma that you've experienced. And you ask God to search you. Even there can be some perverted behaviors or some things that you picked up that you don't even understand, understand why you're behaving that way. That could have wound your soul. It could have been some consensual things that you have done that have caused your soul to be wounded. And that keeps you from seeing the glory of God. That keeps you from allowing him to use you in the way that he desires to use you. Not just profane things that you speak, but things that you think, even if they don't come out of your mouth. Okay, so she went further to say, um, hearing that, and she just spoke to about the child abuse and how it, it, it uh, uh, marks a woman's brain in certain uh, patterns, hearing that could leave a person feeling they would be marked in a negative way for the rest of their lives. But I have good news. We are marked and branded and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we are preserved for God's special use, no matter what we have gone through. And I love that piece, no matter what we have gone through, because that may not be your story. 
but most oftentimes there's going to be some type of trauma. There's going to be something that have marked your brain that needs to be recalibrated because the, the mind, the will, and the emotions are the sum totals of our souls. And if our souls are wounded, then there's darkness there. There's other things there. There's pain there. There's despair there. What is it that have marked your, your mind, your brain, have marked your soul, that put a chink there that you can't move beyond? But the good news is that God, no matter what, he can heal us no matter what it is that we've gone through. And as well, he can use us, but we have to be in a stance of surrender. And in that stance of surrender, let's just rewind the tape mirrors and go back and say, okay, God, if you find anything in me that should not be, let me not just talk about that that someone else thrust up on me. Not let me, don't let me just talk about this list of abuses of any kind, et cetera, that would cause me to think about what someone else did to me. But am I like Isaiah once my flesh dies and I surrender to you that I recognize there were some things that I caused that separated me, that caused wounding to my soul, that wounding would look like perversions. It would look like a brain that is not recalibrated and that has not been redeemed, that is not in alignment with our redeemed souls. I'm, I'm sorry, with our redeemed spirits, because our spirits have been redeemed, but our soul has to be transformed. What's keeping us from aligning with your spirit in our redeemed spirits. What is it in our soul? Where have we been marked? Those things that maybe we don't even want to say out loud, but you know. And I'm now willing, God, to come before you and let you have it. I'm not going to blame shift right now. I'm not going to talk about the things that somebody else did to me and there's, it's real. But how then have I engaged this thing? Because Isaiah said, I'm a man. Whoa, he said, whoa. When his flesh died, his Uzziah died, he said, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. So that means there were some things going on inside of him, in his mind, for him to even say it. And then he didn't even recognize it. Because most oftentimes, marriage, because we feel like that we are checking off some of the boxes with God, that we've arrived in some way, even if we don't say it out loud, or that we're better than the rest are better than the world or those that we live around. But in order for us to truly see what it is that God wants to do and how he wants to heal us, we need to allow him into that place. And it starts with saying, Father, search me. For I am undone. I am wounded. But I'm willing to allow you to touch my soul with hot coal and bring me into that place of alignment with you. And even in the process of that, I'm willing to share with others so that they can be healed as well, so that they can be restored and they can be redeemed. But I can trust that you're going to heal me in the process. And even now, with my confession, I am being healed and I am being transformed. Okay? So Mary's, with that being said, um, there was a passage of scripture, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. If you have your book, you know it's there, but I'm going to ask you to go back and read that and reflect on that. That's that Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. Go back and reflect on that. And then I'm moving further down in 27, where it says, no matter how wounded we are, when we begin our journey towards wholeness, God has guaranteed our success as long as we don't give up. He gathers up the fragments of our broken lives and makes sure that nothing is wasted. So Mary's, can you stand to be healed? Are you willing to allow him in to do it the way he deems fit to do it? Are we willing to look at ourselves and reflect on our lives and see what part we can take ownership of so that he can really get the glory, so that his temple can come in, that, that his train can come in and fill this temple 
which is our souls, to come into alignment with our spirits and bring healing and deliverance there. Are we willing? Are we willing to be healed? Okay. And then it says further on page 28. And I underlined some things there. Let's see. All right. We have been brought, we have been bought with a price and that price is the blood of Jesus. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit to protect us while we are waiting for our full redemption. The devil comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus came that we may have and enjoy our lives, according to John 10 and 10. You have been sealed, Mary's, we have been sealed and marked by God. We are his, and we are safe. And you hear me saying, we there. One of the things, and this is the author saying this as well, one of the things that women want to feel is safe. And I want, she said, and I want you to know that you are safe with God. We are set apart, sanctified for God's use. And that includes any and everything that we have gone through that was painful or damaging. And she says, I urge you to release all of your past pain and wounds that the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit and ask him to begin the restoration project in our lives. Don't waste our pain. Let God work it out for our good. And that stood out to me in the little box over to the side where it says, you have been sealed and marked by God. We have to trust that. And then what she says, don't waste your pain. Let God work it out for your good. In the process of God working it out for our good, Mary's, when we're Martha's, trusting that God is not going to allow us to be hurt again, that he's now, not that we won't ever be hurt, but he's not going to allow us to be wounded in that way. I have to pause there. He won't allow us to be battered and bruised in that way because he is a good, good father and he is a redeemer of our souls. And then our spirits then become, uh, our souls then become uh, syncopated in sync with our redeemed spirits. And then we begin to yield the fruit of the spirit out of our lives that joy, that love, that peace, that goodness, that gentleness, that meekness, that faithfulness, that self-control, that long-suffering, and that forbearance. And therefore, then we will have a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. Nothing missing and nothing broken in our lives, mirrors. And then I want to end with this. I had something I wanted to share with you about uh, forgiveness but, and, and I'm just gonna leave that because we're at time. Um, but let me just share something with you about mending cracks in the soul. And this is a book uh, that I have. We use supplemental material as well. And it's called Ministering Freedom to the Emotionally Wounded. And it's by Doris M. Wagner. And on page 81, in 83, it spoke to mending cracks in the soul. And I'm just gonna share, share that with you and I'll close with that. And then we'll open it up for anyone if you have any burning desires or anything that stood out to you in today's Bible study, because this was just a summary of the book. So you see how in depth you really need to go. And for those of you that don't have the book, Take good notes. Allow the spirit of the Lord to speak to you while you're sitting at the feet of Jesus in the Bible study. So on next week, you'll be able to actually work through the activities because it's all about what he's saying to you. It's not whether it's a right or wrong answer, but the truth 
And the revelation knowledge is in his word. And that's why we have to have our word. So even if you don't have your book, you need to have the word and track with us in these scriptures. So let me just read that from uh, page uh, 81 through uh, 83. You don't have this book, but this is ministering freedom to the emotionally wounded. This is just supplemental. Okay. And it says here. Mending cracks in the soul. The body lacerates, bruises, or breaks because of force of an object on it. But the soul cracks due to trauma and emotional overload. A crack in someone's soul is often much more severe a much more severe injury than one in the body. But if not treated properly, it could result in a warped personality. Remember when she talked about the brain being marked? Then certain types of mindset set in. We always talk about the, uh, the wrong mindset or wilderness mentality, emotional trauma, okay? Not just physical trauma but emotional trauma right if not treated properly it could result in a warped personality much the same as if a broken bone were not set and grew back crooked an emotionally wounded individual is complicated but the problem is compounded by the fact that demons can enter into people at a time of trauma. And that's why we speak to and we identify certain things that are being said. Is there anything in your flesh, Mary's, in our flesh that would keep us from receiving all that God has for us? Is there anything standing in our way? Is there any demons that are there that would keep us from allowing the spirit of the Lord to enter in and his train to fill our temple, his glory to fill our temple and bring that healing and restoration to us. Are there any mind binding spirits that we need to deal with? And I'm not going to speak to what they all look like. But and if you don't know what a mind binding spirit is, it's, it's something like fear, it's something like guilt, it's something like shame, something like unworthiness trauma from certain events of things that have happened to you it could be rebellion it could be performance it could be striving i mean it could be so much and you allow the holy spirit to to tell you what that is it could be anger it could be bitterness unforgiveness okay an emotionally um, emotionally wounded individual will make you think about what self-pity they can be a blockage that can keep you from uh, uh, seeing God high and lifted up on his throne and allowing him to come in and do the work in you. you are you willing to allow him to heal you? But first we got to deal with the trauma and the trauma. How did that enter in? It, certain spirits that enter in during trauma, okay? An emotionally wounded individual is complicated, but the problem is compounded by the fact that demons can enter into people at times of trauma. For example, one of the most dysfunctional characters in the whole Bible is the madman of Gordia. It is apparent that he had demons and that the demons had to be cast out. But the conclusion of his deliverance was that he was clothed Seated, this is the conclusion, that he was clothed, seated, and in his right mind. Yes, the demons were a problem, but how they got in was the fundamental problem. He had a crack in his soul that allowed demons to come in. Consequently, this was the last item that needed to be fixed according to Mark 5 and 15. The emphasis of this account is not the demons, but the deliverance that came through Jesus' through Jesus 
to this man. So in other words, when we then recognize that we have soul wounds, let's not reflect on the Marys as something that someone else did to us. Clearly, we're not delusional. We know that there are things that have happened to us, right? But let's take a look at them from a perspective of God. Here are the things that I recognize are operating in my soul that keeps me bipolar, that keeps me from being transformed into your likeness, that keeps me, to, you know, defaulting into things that and spiraling out of control or into things that I know that are not of you, or even guilt and shame and self-pity that won't even allow me to fulfill your purposes and plans in my life. Therefore, his glory and his train can't fill this temple. If we're not willing to allow Jesus to do what he did for the madman that was filled with demons, we ought to be ready we got to be willing so that we can then be clothed in our right minds. That means our souls coming into syncopation with our spirits through the transformation of his word, through the blood of Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And how does that transformation happen? By first acknowledging that there are some things that are unclean within us, even like Isaiah putting that hot tongues to our mouths and saying, God, I recognize that. You may not want to say it to others, but I recognize it. I recognize there's some things that's in me that are unclean. Other people may not see it because I can wear the mask real well. I'm doing your will. Isaiah was a mighty prophet. But he said, woe is me. Can we stop marriage and stop blaming everybody else for why we on here going through healing the soul of a woman? And say, God, here I am. It's me. I take ownership of this. I do take ownership of this, God. So now, Jesus, I want to be delivered from bitterness, from anger, from self-pity, from resentment, from, from disobedience and rebellion, from fear, from guilt, from shame. Everything striving and performance, everything that would keep us bound and not being able to see God high and lifted up on his throne. I want to gross level my Uzziah today. What is that king that is living on the altar of my soul that's blocking me and keeping me from seeing you, God? Therefore, I can't receive the healing in my soul, in those cracks, in those wounds, in those oozes, in those places that you want to heal in me. Because of shame, I don't, I, I don't even want you to use me in that area because people might see it. But the reality is, is when we give it to him, that's where the healing is going to come forth. That's where he clothes us in our right mind and he clothes us in righteousness. And nothing will be missing and nothing will be broken. Okay. So do not despair. These issues can be fixed if we recognize that there is a problem. So we have to take ownership of it, Marys. Let's not blame shift. Let's not keep blaming mama, daddy, friends, those that hurt us, you know, uh, ex-spouses, you know, whomever, okay? I mean, I don't even want to say it for you, you know, because it could be children. I mean, it could be people on the job, people in the church. I mean, et cetera. Self-sabotage. Do not despair. These issues can be fixed if we recognize that there is a problem and refer to the word of God as our textbook for treatment. The bottom line is if we do not fix the crack whereby the demons came in, we will have to do deliverance again. Now, 
God wants the wounded. So now listen, we're not contradicting what we said. He wants the wounded and he uses us in the process of healing. He drives them out little by little. And even as a crackpot, that that I think is defective, once his, uh, his temple comes in and, and, and feels, his, his train comes in and feel my temple, his glory in essence, come in and feel my temple and brings healing and deliverance to me, I might think that there are still defects in me if I have a Uzziah that's still living in my flesh that don't recognize that this is what, how God is using me. And I call it an imperfection, but he calls it perfection. I might say that it's ashes, but he said it's beauty. And I'm just pausing right there. The bottom line is that, and, the, and, and they say if we don't fix it, but we don't fix it, we allow him to fix it. We allow him to fix it. And I'm gonna stop there, I mean, cause I could keep going because there's so much more to this, but I'm gonna stop right there, Marys. I think that that's en enough. Um, is there anything I'm going to, Ask Minister Sarah if we can, let's see. I think I can. I'm gonna pause the recording so that if there's anything anyone wants to say, that they can off the record. All right, Marys. Now, I'm going to just read these questions to you from the study guide. And these, based on the uh, review that we did this week, and of course your own personal review, the review of the chapter, that's what we just completed in chapter three, God Wants the Wounded. I'm just going to read these questions to you for those of you especially that do not have a book so that you can go ahead this week and work on that. So when we come back next week, that's what we're going to do, just the study guide, okay? So we wanna make sure that you have these questions down. All right, so uh, for those of you uh, that have your books, so then just kind of track with us, and those of you that don't, have your pen out. Here we go. So for chapter three in the study guide, these are the, the, uh, the questions that we're gonna work through on next week. It says, before you begin, read chapter three in Healing the Soul of a Woman. We've done that. We've done the summary on that. So the next thing is in touch with yourself. And the, question under in, the questions under in touch with yourself are this, as follows. How have you followed through with your plans to begin the healing process? How have you followed through with your plans to begin the healing process? The next question says, read the opening quote by Brianna Manning. What do you think it means? Do you think your wounds resemble anything Jesus went through while he was on earth? Explain. The next question says, Take some time to honestly evaluate how much you want to be healed and what you are doing to seek healing. Journal your thoughts. The next question says, how open are you to share what you've been through and what you are currently struggling with? Okay, the next question says, God deliberately chooses those who have been wounded to work in his kingdom army. And I actually underlined that, so I'll give y'all that. I underlined that and highlighted that. And then it says, and this is the same question, okay? God deliberately chooses those who have been wounded to work in his kingdom army. He works through their wounds and weaknesses, and people see his power. When people in the world 
think they are strong and have all the qualifications they need, but they are not leaning and relying on God. He often has to pass them over and instead choose someone who is less qualified from a worldly perspective, but is entirely dependent upon him in all areas of their life. As you put your trust in God, the day may come when even the people who hurt you will witness the mighty things that God has done in your life and through you as his instrument. What do you think the statement being experienced is a benefit, but getting the experience is painful means? And I'll repeat that. What do you think the statement being experienced is a benefit, but getting the experience is painful means? Then the next question says, instead of thinking about how much you have gone through in life that has been painful, why not think about all the experience that you now have and all the opportunities that are before you as God's daughter? Remember with God, there are no rejects. That's why Jesus said, he who believes in him, who clings to, trust in, relies on him, is not judged. He is, he who trusts in him never comes up for judgment. For him, there is no rejection, no condemnation. He incurs no, no damnation, John 3 and 18. And then it says, under exploring God's word, okay? So that was just kind of like a little statement that she talked about and she gave scriptural reference, that that I just read, okay? And then we move on to exploring God's word and it says, read Hebrews 5, 8 through 9 from several translations and then write it in your own words, okay? So that's work, that's what you're gonna do. And then the next part of this says, under exploring God's words, it says, these two scripture verses speak volumes to me. Not only about Jesus, but also about my own life. Jesus needed experience in order to be our high priest so he could truly say that he understands our pain. My experience with Jesus, Jesus' healing power, qualified me to boldly tell others that Jesus would heal their wounded souls just as he had mine. Jesus suffered, he gained experience, and it equipped, equipped him for what his father wanted him to do. Paul wrote, and I underline this, Paul wrote that he had, that we have a high priest who is able to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses because he has gone through the things we've gone through and that's gone through now, according to Hebrews 4 and 15. I am amazed each time I read and contemplate these scriptures and they give me hope that what I have been through will be used to help others. Think about, now here's the question is, think about what it means to offer your experience to God for his use. Write a prayer asking God to use you. Be open to hearing what God has to say. And then the next question says, what does it mean that God takes broken pieces of our lives and make beautiful things. And then it says, either draw a picture or find a picture that illustrates this concept. Keep it in a place you will see often. Okay, and then the next statement there, or a little paragraph there with the question underneath that, it says, Elizabeth Elliot said, of one thing I am sure, God's story never ends with ashes. And I highlighted that. And it says, that statement touched me. And this is the author, of course, y'all know talking because this is the activity group. That statement touches me deeply and gives me hope. 
We may begin with ashes, but when we give them to Jesus, he makes something beautiful. Don't let your pain be wasted by being bitter and resentful throughout life because you feel that you have been unjustly treated. Instead, make your experiences a valuable tool for helping others. And then she says, read Isaiah 41, 15 through 17 out loud. Listen at this out loud several times. What do these verses reveal about how God wants to use you as his instrument? Okay, then the next question, do you believe there is nothing that has hurt you that God can't heal or restore in your life? Why or why not? All right, then the next question says, use the lines below, and so whatever paper, whatever you have, Use the lines below to thank God that there is nothing you cannot recover from and nothing that God cannot heal. All right, the next question says, how does it feel to know that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, kept safe by God? And then she went further to just speak to about being sanctified and in, in, in set apart. She says, you are set apart, sanctified for God's use. And that includes any and everything that you have gone through that was painful or damaging. She says, I urge you to release all of the past pain and wounds to the Holy Spirit and ask him to begin his restoration project in your life. Don't waste your pain. Let God work it out for your good. And then the last thing is the healing in action. And there's two questions there. And the first one says, what ways do you envision God using your pain to help others? And the last question says, what is one way you can let God use your pain for your good or to help others this week. All right, Marys, so that is it. Now we are going to go ahead and pray and we're gonna close out. We're gonna give any individual that will hear this and especially us Marys that are sitting at the feet of Jesus an opportunity to do a hard reset or a heart reset because there was something that was said in the summary in this chapter three, God wants the wounded, that tugged on our hearts and we know that in order for our Uzziah to die, our flesh to die so that God's temple, God's train can fill our temples, then we're going to need to, if you feel that tug in your heart, rededicate your life. Rededicate. You know what you need to do. You know what you need to do so that you can see him hind lifted up, so that you can see him, whatever those things are, those mind binding spirits, those things, those ain'ts, those things that have caused you to shrink back and not give him everything and not surrender and not let him have even that thing. Yes, it's a wound, but he says he wants the wounded. So we're going to trust him in that. And we're going to rededicate our lives to him right now so that he can then come in. <laughs> His glory can come in and fill this temple and bring that healing and deliverance and restoration that we so desire. And we're willing to let him have it and do it the way he desires to do it. We're willing to say, I'm willing to be healed. And then for individuals that will hear this Bible study, this comes across your news feed, you've never received Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. But there was a lot that was said, and you know that you're broken. You know that you're wounded, and you want to be healed, and you want to be set free. And not only that, you want to secure your fire insurance, but you're willing to let go of your life. You're willing to lose your life so that you can gain it. And in the abundant life that God gives, there's nothing missing and nothing broken. 
So we're going to ask you to pray this prayer of salvation with us. And then after we pray the prayer of salvation, we ask that you would get connected to a Bible teaching church. You know, you can then as well subscribe here at His Ministry only send us an email if you'd like to get connected because it is going to be important that you continue on this journey with us or you continue on the journey okay doing what the lord has called you to do and you have to stay in your word because that is the cure the word of god what you know that is his mind that is his heart and that is a part of our transformation process we cannot be renewed without his word, okay? And you can't do anything in the kingdom without his code of conduct. That is his word. That's what you're going to need for this journey. So we're going to ask you to pray this prayer with us, and then we will close out with a prayer. And Mary's, those of you that would like to hang on, please hang on with us. If you have anything that you would like to share, even after, we'll stop the recording. But let's pray this prayer of salvation as we close out. And then we'll just pray a, another prayer just about some trauma and some things that God is doing and wants to do in and through us. Okay, so let's pray this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross of Calvary and that on the third day you were raised from the dead and you are now sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for me. I believe that your blood pays for my sins and has provided me with a free gift of salvation and eternal life. Therefore, I confess my sins, and I ask that you would forgive me of all of my sins. By faith, I receive forgiveness, and I receive the free gift of salvation and eternal life. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come into my heart and that you would take up residency within me. Fill me with your love, with your light, with your truth, and with revelation. I make room for you, Lord. I gross level every altar to self, everything that has been keeping me from seeing you, every blockage, every mind-binding spirit and stronghold that even comes to mind now, that would even steep itself in forgiveness, in unforgiveness. I ask for forgiveness right now. And I thank you for healing. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you for restoration. I thank you for salvation. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your light. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for revelation knowledge. And I acknowledge you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord Jesus, we ask that you would come, our Lord and Savior, our sovereign God, and bring peace to our souls. Come and establish your dominion of peace in our hearts and manifest yourself in a way that we will know that you are here and allow us to feel the depths of your love. We ask that you would re rebuke any forces of darkness that seek to cause us harm or to keep trauma in place in any way or have tried to keep us locked in a prison of trauma. We thank you, Father, that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a soundness of mind. We thank you that even now, in the process of our healing and being yielded to you, mind, will, and emotions, that we are being clothed in our right mind. And we claim it 
today. We declare it and we decree it. We know that it is so in your word. And as we pray, we ask that you will, that you would be like a sponge and draw from all the pain out of our lives of trauma, shock, fear, terror, and shame, bringing it all to the death at the foot of your cross, Jesus. You suffered and you died so that we could be delivered, that we could be set free, that we could be redeemed, that we would be made whole, nothing missing and nothing broken. And we thank you for all that you accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. All right, Marys, we love you. We love you back. And for those of you that you don't have any burning desires and you don't want to hang on, we'll see you on next week. And 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, if you're in the Central Time Zone, it would be 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time or 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. But for those of you that have burning desires or you would like to discuss further or you need further ministry, because Minister Sarah and I, we are healing and deliverance ministers. We'll be willing to talk to you or if you wanted to set up a session with us, hang on and we will talk with you. So we'll see you on next week, Marys. Hugs, hugs, hugs. <laughs>